Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mahaba. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. My name is Dia Caldwell. And I am joining you from Oklahoma in the United States. Um, I was born and raised here and I did move to England when I was 18 years old. I currently work at the University of Oklahoma for the Vice President of OU Outreach. I am a trained historian. My specialty was feminist history in the United States, but I also studied feminist history in the Middle East. I am a mom. I have three beautiful children. I am an artist. I'm a wife and I'm a storyteller. And one of the ways in which I like to capture the human experience as I see it through the lens of history, as well as my experiences overseas, is to use poetry as that vehicle to tell the narrative. And so one of the things that I want to do really quickly before I actually jump into the poems, you can see my background is the title of, of the lecture Aftershock, and this is going to be a poetic curation of Western European colonization in the United States. And over here, you see um, Act One. I broke this lecture into four parts. Act One, feminism. Act Two is a political discourse. Act Three is an economic discourse. And Act Four is called Sapient Nation. Before I jump into the lecture, I really quickly want to give you a um, overview of my creative practice. So give me a quick second while I share my screen. Dr. Shihada, could you enable screen sharing permission? Yes, yes, just give me one second. Yeah, the floor is yours, Day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Everybody who is joining or who has um, didn't hear me say, I dropped a couple of documents in the chat to help with this. Um, so the first document that I dropped is uh, terms and concepts that are, were really pervasive within the United States during the 19th century, especially, which led to westward expansion of the US, what became the modern US. Um, I, I draw on a lot of this when I'm, when I'm speaking in my poems. Um, and then the last document that I dropped is the actual lecture with the selected poetry. I'm not gonna be able to probably read all of these poems today. We did, um, I did record this lecture in advance and Dr. Shihara is going to post that to his YouTube. So it will be available for a full access of all of the poems. You can also access my poetry at Word Depot 30. Com. I just put that in the chat too. And I am going to share my screen. This is my site, worddepot30.com. And under this tab, Bleeding Heart, I have put all of my poems. Each one of these entries is a poem. I have published about 400, and you can see the most recent 50. Not only do I like to use words to describe my emotions or what I'm trying to say um, about political and economic discourse in the US or even feminism, um, I like to use paintings as well. And so I do paint on my poetry too. And I'm also a musician. That's another way that I really try to convey stories is through the music. Um, and so right here under this tab, Buzzing Years, here are a few songs that I've written and recorded over the years. Um, Burning Mind is a space I created for thoughts that are poetic in nature, but they're not quite poems. And so talking about this platform, um, some of the cultural complexities going on in the United States include race relations. One of the things I would like to point out is that um, we've never done this before in US history where this many humans from this many different backgrounds and cultures have been living under one national umbrella. And so 
when the U.S. was conceived as a country, um, it was it the power structures were preserved for the white men at the top of Western European descent who who colonized this territory, and so as waves of immigration have come into the United States, um, and as we continue to have more people become U.S. citizens from all over the world, we continue to challenge the narrative of power structures. And so that's one of the things that makes what's happening here very complex. We are also, especially the region in the United States in which I come from, which is the mid to southwestern United States, is very, very conservative. It's very far right evangelical Protestant Christianity. One of the things I would like to point out here that makes it super complex is that there are thousands, and I'm not, I'm not kidding when I say thousands, of versions of, Christi, uh, of Protestant Christianity. And so nothing like this exists anywhere else in the world either. Um, we do have large Catholic populations and we do have Eastern Orthodoxy, even in the state of Oklahoma. Um, but the, the dominant cultural, cultural narrative is, is this evangelical Protestantism. And so that's also one of the issues that, um, that's driving the sociocultural narrative of the United States. Uh, the U.S. is very rooted in patriarchal hierarchies, um, and I would point to the fact that we've never had a female president. Um, we finally have our first female vice president, and only 30% of CEOs sitting at the decision-making table for Fortune 500 companies are, um, are women. And so that that narrative is very dominant even in our house. And so things that, that I've been raised in my hearing in my culture is that women aren't, aren't le like we, we shouldn't be in positions of leadership. Um, one of the things you'll hear is that we are, we're too emotional or, and so all of that comes through in the poetry as well. Um, so getting to the poetry, this is one of the ways in which I fight back against the injustices as I see it. And I pull from my lens in history and my lived experiences overseas, as well as growing up in the mid to southwestern United States, I was raised um, very in a very Christian household. And so I grew up reading the narrative of the life of Jesus Christ, that impacted me. The life of Jesus Christ impacted me. His teachings impacted me. Um, I would say the way that the U.S. uses Christianity many times, um, in my view, it, it has distorted the original teachings of Jesus Christ. And I, I'm seeing an absence of of what he intended um, and how we should live our lives. And so I use poetry to challenge that as well. And so um, let me go ahead and pull up the poem that I want to start with. I chose the title Aftershock um, for the lecture because I do like to draw on the natural world as well as historical concepts to reinforce what I'm trying to say in the poetry. As you know, when an earthquake happens, the residual aftershock can last hours. It can last days, months. Well, that's true for colonialism. Colonialism has devastated the entire world. And we like to give tidy timelines to when an event happens in history like colonialism, but the reality of, of imperialism, colonialism um, is that it's not over. We're, we're still experiencing those residual aftershocks, especially here in the United States. And so, um, or I'm speaking from the lens of the United States, not especially in, in the United States. 
Um, and so what I'm going to do with this lecture, um, I chose Aftershock. It's in four parts. Part one is feminism. Part two is a political discourse. Part three is an economic discourse. And part four is going to be how do we move forward? What is the solution here? How do we shift from where we are out of colonialism? And um, I, in many of these poems, I'm very angry. I'm very angry at the dominant cultural lies. I'm very angry at the cultural narratives. And so this is, this is my way of fighting back. So abuse um, is very rampant in the United States. The stats vary, um, but it's around one in four women that you encounter have been sexually assaulted, abused, or raped in their lifetime. That is, those are only the, re the reported statistics. Um, every 72 seconds, a, an American human is, um, is abused. Uh, we experience both physical abuse, sexual, or we, we experience physical abuse, sexual abuse, as well as psychological abuse. And that's a part of the, the cultural dominant or the dominant cultural narrative they use to help preserve these power structures. So I'm gonna open with um, a poem titled Charles Church and Me. Charles Church is a, um, it was a cathedral in England. It's in Plymouth, England. And it was out during World War II. And so the roof, the stained glass, everything was taken out of this church, except the walls still remained. And so the city of Plymouth preserved the church by putting it in the middle of this roundabout. So when you enter the city, you drive around this church um, and they put lights all around the outside and all on the inside. So at night, it lights up so beautifully. And it is there as a monument to what Europe experienced during the, the air raids of World War II. And so I use this as an example to talk about what it's like to be in an abusive relationship. These hallowed grounds did quake with grief. You tried to steal my footing like a stone cold thief, but I held up the doorway to regain my peace while you hurled bombs at me. One of your many talents I know too well, you would kiss me goodnight and then bid me to hell. Grace was not a place from which you fell, as far as anyone can see. The beautiful thing about when everything breaks is you get to rebuild from ground zero stakes. Your heart doesn't always beat, it just palpitates, a hammered chest to rapidity. When the dust has settled and all the smoke cleared, the church bell has fallen there's no more tolling here. This gathering place seems lost to the second great war years, like Charles Church bombed entirely. I grabbed a shovel and dug a legacy to last. I held up my middle finger to your icon clasp. You can't erase stories with a 300 year past. I'm even more beautiful now, you see? Though my roof was blown off, my walls are still stout. I now light up an island from the inside out. I'm a place of remembrance on a busy roundabout. My ground remains a sanctuary. You can't imagine the aura when that glow shines at night, a skeleton of a church giving way to the light. It's a victim of blitz that put up a fight built to last as a testimony. If you can muster the courage to make that drive all around, you'll see that your war couldn't be won on my ground. Without a roof or stained glass, we're still structurally sound. Charles Church and me. And so that's going to move me into the next poem in Act One, Wild Woman. Many of my poems are about me. Um, I write them about myself, for myself, uh, to myself. Yeah. Um, and so 
this one is when you don't fit into the social narratives that you, they want you to fit into, when you challenge the social narratives, you'll often find that you are on the receiving end of a lot of hostility. And um, part of me is just making peace with that. So this is called Wild Woman. They feed us sugar and spice to make us nice. And most conform to that social norm, but I much prefer rolling the dice. And that's gonna take us into the last one in act one called fringe. In English, the word fringe can represent several different meanings. One of the meanings is for people who sit on the outside of these social constructs that they want everybody to fit into. And um, I guess a, an example I could give of that is the movement of punk rock. Punk rock was a, um, a fringe music movement as resistance to the system. And so I'll, I'll read it, fringe. I've always preferred a little fringe on rugs and displayed as bangs. But it, when it comes to resistance, fringe was written in my name. Feminist, lover of humanity, my world is a colorful place where every religion, race, and creed belongs to my human race. Most of us bleed blue and red. Only 5% exist in between. My sharpened tongue is the weapon of French, speaking against those who only bleed green. And that's about speaking out against the greed that goes on in this culture. So this takes us into act two, and this is the political discourse. This next poem is titled The Way of the West, and this is a quick snapshot history of of Western colonization of the United States and then westward expansion. Half of the United States belonged to Mexico. Um, and in the 19th century, there was the Mexican-American War in which, in which colonizers took the rest of that landmass and, and um, what became the border of the modern United States. The way the West was won was at the barrel of a gun. Evacuate and displace, assimilate and erase until we've destroyed them one by one. We justified slaughtering humanity through the discourse of manifest destiny, railroads and westward expansion, gold rushes and opening land runs were necessary evils, can't you see? The way the West was built was propped up by human stilt, slaves, and then Chinese, the Irish, and then Mexican. They're subhuman, there's no need for guilt. We'll keep the ones who are legal. We need them to keep the elite regal, modern slavery and oppression, poverty and indiscretion, keeps them completely and totally expendable. And now we'll build a wall to demoralize them all, trapped inside the USA, so they can't get away. We can't have them escaping, so we'll build it tall. Oh, you thought it was so they couldn't get in? The illegal and entitled Mexican? The few and far between? The ones you've never seen? Here's a shovel, Miguel. Now go dig in. Who do you think will build the wall? The one you want so tall, the white man or the African? You dummy, it's the Mexican, because the Indians, we almost killed them all. The way the West was smashed was by electing what should have been trashed, bankruptcies and a disordered personality. Made him a good businessman, you see, and for his expense, America will be cashed. And now we hear your faithful voices praising Jesus in your rejoices. Because Christ belonged to the GOP, don't you know anything about antiquity? 
capitalism was laden in his choices. In fact, his parables clearly state that if you truly want to be great, accumulate a gross amount of wealth, like Lazarus, disregard the poor man's health, then you'll inherit God's heavenly state. The way they'll remember the West was that it fell just like the rest. Neither isolated nor exempt, history will hold complete contempt. Your checks and balances won't pass the test. And if you were born a peasant, eating grub instead of pheasant, and root stews with wheat grasses, cupping hands instead of glasses, then you're nothing more than a disposable pissant. If you find internal unrest in my writing of the way of the West, greedy and hypocritical, in need of vagina and less testicle, then act better than the rest. And so many of the poems, or several of these poems that I'm gonna read in this political discourse, I wrote them in 2017. And this was a year into Trump's presidency. And those of us who are social scientists, anthropologists, study the humanities, psychologists, psychiatrists, we were terrified. We've seen these personality signs in history and we were, we were genuinely terrified. And so that's where a lot of these poems come from. And coming from a region of the world that really supported him and still does in a lot of ways. Um, it was my intense frustration on the whole situation and my fear. This next one is titled Be Speckled Hours. I use the natural world again here um, to really try to describe how politicians and people trying to preserve power will um, they, they manipulate, um, they try to control the perspective of the people. And it's, it's scary actually at how many people actually buy into it, um, but not everybody does. And so this is titled Be Speckled Hours. Among this political wreckage, you believe you are immune. You've mastered how to package and sell stands of a shifting dune into a breakable capsule that keeps false measurements of each hour, marginalizing the ones who supported you to build your granular tower. Through entitlement, you've monopolized oases to moisten against the arid dry. While the pool is a plenty for all of us, you require some of us to shrivel and die. Our imposed lots are pre-existing conditions to legislate against and ignore the premium of living beneath you is the reward of being poor. But dunes cannot be bought or owned. They shift according to their own will. So you try to protect your sand castle by branding trickery from the hill. You've marketed success in a package with shiny American Jesus trim. But according to Luke 16, 19 through 31, you clearly don't know him. Nomads have always roamed these sands, navigating its every inclination. They've mastered its whispers and drifting winds, mindfully reaching their destination. They know it scolds and burns and blasts, remembering no matter your best attempt, no sand castle ever lasts, and not one of us is exempt. Sand castles built with shovel and pail don't build you towers in the sky. In the end, all our glasses crack and every single one of us will die. And so this takes me into vigilante justice. This draws on the Statue of Liberty. Battle up your horses, boys, and sound the drums of war. Lady Liberty's concierge bell is off beat to the fascist score. Her hand is being forced down from her torch to her hip to draw. Pretty soon, she'll no longer be a beacon, but the Wild West's most notorious outlaw. They'll plaster her face in photos, 
most wanted and preferably dead, but queens who truly love their people don't let crowns slip from their heads. For it is her mark of honor, a maternal sign to welcome and protect, upright and stoic in all her glory. She has no room to bow or defect. If she's forced to put her torch down so she can free both of her hands, you won't find a lady standing there, but a vigilante under her own command. Behind her, you'll see a people, her militia, who are willing to die for an idea of freedom and glory for every last ounce of human right. And it very well may happen as she lays down that fiery torch, he will intentionally set nationalism ablaze, knowing purification comes from a scorch. And then this takes us into Act Three, um, the an economic discourse. Uh, America, the United States, as many of you probably know, we are a very, very materialistic culture. We are. Um, all about things, the more things we can buy. And, um, and this is something that I have serious issues with. And our free market capitalism absolutely relies on the majority of us buying into this consumer culture. And so I, I use the poetry to also challenge that. Um, really quickly to give a, a parable from the New Testament of the Bible. Um, I'm very sarcastic in these poems to some degree about how I speak about Jesus because in one breath, people in this culture, not all, not all, but enough people in this culture are, you know, claim to be Christians, but on the other hand, um, are willing to to consume and maintain power and maintain greed and money at the expense of other human beings. And that does not align. And so there's a parable in the New Testament where this very wealthy man comes to Jesus and says, teacher, how may I inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, sell all of your belongings and follow me. So in that parable, we're shown right there that, and, and he says that that's how you may be perfect. You give up your materialism and you follow me. And so that, that's a space in our culture that is very hypocritical, that just does not align. So this poem is titled The Enterprise of Overkill. In the supply, you appear to be sated. This no, the overkill has you baited. This next one is titled The Economics of Misfortune, Story of Renegade Capitalism. I can see your fists are clenched around dissension to the new economic thinking thoroughfare. Your mouth speaks of Christ's crucifixion and ascension, while your actions indicate a lack of biblical flair. You see, you can say the sky is yellow as loud as you want, but research demonstrates a more factual view. So you get antagonistic and louder as you jeer and taunt because you don't benefit from the sky being blue. 400 year old economic systems coming out of a medieval place do not be long in a globalized progressive world when the stakes are the human race. Geneticists have confirmed an amazing story. We are all genetically linked. Mother Africa still holds the most diversity. It's time for medieval thinking to go extinct. The model from Western European colonization earns profit from the misfortune of others. Warm pews and songs of praise won't cut it when boots remain on the necks of our sisters and brothers. It's okay that new ways of thinking threaten you to a generation's endowed core. You have a choice to dig deep and get fluid. Your way holds the same fate 
as the dinosaur. You see, there is no perfect structure. That's why fluidity must drive the day. In an acceptable system that embraces the future with a pie that gives everyone a say. Your alignment to medieval thinking poses a great risk even unto yourself. You're too busy clinging to a ship that is sinking after hitting a quickly deteriorating economic ice shelf. The bigger picture might not have a perfect solution, but traversing backwards is not the purview. The earth has never been flat, nor the sky yellow. It is round with a sky that is blue. And so this next one is titled Depart, and it, it is um, about how much the, the media and the news and social media um, are really impacting the, the psyche of the United States. Piece by piece, these brick and mortar tabloids construct a thinking paradigm for you. And so I'm going to end with, um, I'm going to end with a poem titled, for Act 3, I'm going to end with a poem titled, It's Calvary, Not Cavalry. So Calvary is what many people in the U.S. refer to as the cross in which Jesus Christ was crucified upon because many Christians in the United States put a lot of stock in, um, in his death, not his life. And that's one of the ways I also challenge this. Um, in my view, it was more about what he left us in the way he chose to live his life than anything with the death. And then a cavalry is our, our mounted soldiers on horseback with guns. They told you to be like Jesus when you were ripe and young. You actually took them seriously and you refused to play with guns. They tried to crucify you for it. That's how Second Amendment rights control. What happened to putting ears back on heads instead of watching them roll? I read Love Thy Neighbor and Turn the Other Cheek. Bless those who curse you and only find after you seek. How about not conforming yourself to the patterns of this world or arm yourself with God's armor when shit really becomes unfurled? Out of faith, hope, and love, love is actually the greatest of these, but you continue to focus on death, a much more aggressive and controlling disease. I guess you believe in theory, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Jesus' life was the ultimate law Stop focusing on his death. There doesn't have to be a Wild West or dueling side freak shows, dressing kids in bulletproof vests to NRA Ephesians 6.10 through 14 pros. There's praying for those who don't understand while taking up your own cross, put there by the Pharisee's hand, hoping they could claim a loss. There's feeding the poor and loving thy neighbor, the reconciliation of women, just by how Christ was delivered. I mean, Mary's womb held the heavens. That's how he came to earth, through a woman's vagina, through a very human birth. Our violent Euro-patriarchal culture took gunpowder from the Chinese, turning church bells into cannons, calling the faithful to their knees. Your American Messiah's twisted commands are clearly nothing but for show. You own the finest looking high horse keeping empty stables and your fields fallow, raping and pillaging as you giddy up and go with a nationalist American flag cape flapping in the wind as you blow, smoke from your ears and steam when your tongue rolls because your pew is warm, but your heart is cold. I will never stop advocating for Middle Eastern Jesus Christ's legacy. You've mistaken one simple letter it's Calvary, not Cavalry. And so this is going to take us into Act, 
Act Four, and I'm going to end with two poems. This next one is called AB Positive. This is my blood type. Hey, we yeah. have uh, one minute. I will okay. uh, send you the link for the other session. You finish okay. your poems, and then we will open the discussion with the students, right? Okay. If I, um, Dr. Shihada, if I have just one minute, do we want to go ahead and end? Yes, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Want, okay. Uh -huh. So AB positive um, is the universal receiver. So I can literally receive blood from every human on earth. But I'm also the universal donor of plasma. So I can donate plasma to every human on earth. So I play on this to talk about race and, and ethnic relations in the United States. And this really applies to colonization.